All right, so it's been it's been quite a day so far. Um, so we're we're doing this track. So we have a pass keys 101. And we've did we've talked about um, pass keys in the enterprise. So next up, we're going to look at a little bit of like a pulse of the industry, which is always nice to see. Okay, we we have considerations, we have best practices, but what's actually happening um, in the world of IAM? And so we're lucky to have Simon Muffet who is the founder and analyst at the Cyber Hut, who's going to share some of his latest data with us on this very topic. So Simon, please take it away. No, I think it was me. Should I stand here? I think it's the dual mics, I think. Um, I, don't, I, don't, I don't touch it. There we go. Right, is that good? You can hear? Super. Um, I'm not going to mention the word passkeys for at least 24 minutes. So if, if, you, need to, if you need to hear the word passkey, um, this is probably not the session for you. Um, I, wanna, I do want to take a pulse of the industry, if you like. Um, I work at an industry analyst firm called The Cyber Hut, and we try and track some of the emerging trends, patterns, problems that are happening globally across the entire identity space. And I want to try and share some of, some of that stuff with us today. So where is identity? 20 years ago, identity was the operations guy who was stuck in a darkened room. He was doing password resets. He was doing MFA. I started off doing mainframe security administration back, back in the day. It wasn't very exciting. It wasn't very sexy. Roll forward to now. And it is empowering every single interaction we do online. We've all probably been working today remotely. We've been accessing online services. We've been making payments online, watching Netflix. All of that stuff has identity at its core. So the industry, the solutions that we're generating are on a huge journey. The problems, both industry, employees, B2C, IoT, the problems being generated are hugely foundational and hugely need identity as a foundation. So I want to take a look at maybe where we're heading as industry over the next maybe five or six years. So um, the cyber hood, uh, somebody described the cyber hood recently as the Gartner for IAM. Um, everyone's heard of Gartner. Who likes Gartner? Hands up, who likes Gartner? That's harsh, that's harsh. Um, Gartner, our, our biggest pipeline actually um, for, for next year. The Cyber Hut is the fourth fastest growing industry analyst firm globally, which um, I'm quite proud of that. I'm equally quite terrified of that as well. There's a huge demand for knowledge around cybersecurity, technology, identity based security, authentication, authorization. It's a huge for understanding the technologies, understanding use cases, vendor patterns, emerging trends, because this stuff is complicated, it's nuanced, it's difficult to measure. We've heard so many talks this morning around how passwords are rubbish, rubbish for security, rubbish for usability, been around for 60 years, yet we are still using passwords every single day. We're still having to enable everybody on the benefits of passkeys in the FIDO and in biometrics. This stuff is difficult. And the signpost's role is to try and do two things. One is enable industry through research and through understanding some of those emerging trends, but really trying to empower and enable and simplify some of the key problems we face. And we do this via research. We use AI, another buzzword. We track vendors. We track about 65 different vendors in the identity space. And we look for patterns. We use empiricism. We use different models to try and find some trends. But what I'm going to share today it's a bit of anecdotal research, a bit of fun research, if you like. Well, we've asked the Cyberhook community about 10,000 practitioners, but we've asked them various different questions using things like social media, LinkedIn, newsletters, interviews, surveys, on some of the key topics and questions that we're all starting to think about as practitioners and as consultants and as, and as vendors, I guess, as well. So question number one, and it's always good to start each year with a what will die question. Is it going to be passwords? Is it going to be SAML? I think SAML, didn't SAML die about 10 years ago? Yeah, SAML is probably stronger now than it's ever been, right? So everything 
nothing's dying, yet nothing's dying. Um, so we asked the question back in, in January time, which identity components will eventually die off, I guess, in the next two months? We've got two, two months to go. Um, very close uh, set of results on this one. Um, Password-based authentication, 30%, second top. On-premise directories came out 37% um, as the biggest thing, which is likely to die off by the end of 2023. Main reasons for this, I think clearly there's a huge migration to the cloud in, in every level, not just directories, but things like SaaS, cloud-based delivery of applications and services, which is probably slowly pulling where we store our identity data. Clearly, the solution providers in this space, the big CSPs, Google, Amazon, Microsoft, all provide identity storage capabilities, and then there are new, new, nuanced vendors as well providing that capability. But there's pros and cons. Um, cloud directories need feeding, they need watering, they need governance. Uh, you need to be able to get clean identity data into those uh, cloud-based repositories as well. So clearly, I, I think on-prem directories will be around yet, probably for the five, six, seven years. I imagine, especially as we, we typically operate in this hybrid cloud environment anyway, where perhaps SaaS is the first choice for application delivery, but some of that core infrastructure is still probably going to be either on-prem or within a private cloud ecosystem for a number of years yet. And SAML, passwords, ABAC, um, I think they will also be around in probably another decade or so, mainly due to technology uh, lag and, and things as well. Question number two. Do we need to have a chief identity officer? And a quick, quick show of hands. Is any, do we have any chief identity officers in the room? I know of at least one person uh, in Europe who has their title as a chief identity officer. Anybody? It's still very niche. It's still very, it's very rare. It's unusual to have. Yet 61% responded and said, yes, we need to have a CIO or a chief ID or chief identity officer. Um, I think there's a, there's, a, there's a bit of a nuance to this. Um, the, the biggest focus, I think, was really around if your organization was looking to deliver external-based identity services, so that B2C, consumer, customer, citizen-style uh, project, where the metrics, the technology, uh, the operational management of those projects is very, very different to B2E enterprise identity. Um, how you design, how you handle usability, security, the metrics, the measurements, fundamentally different for B2C. And I think where the origins of this answer is probably coming from is if you are going through a big B2C project, there's a lot of different stakeholders involved. Digital, uh, CIO, CDO, Chief Digital Officers, they all have a very much larger and very distinct interest in identity. And are those interests being represented by the CIO, by the CISO, by somebody else. It's very rare to have a senior identity person in that C-level conversation. So there's definitely demand and interest for what identity is doing within those B2C style projects. So again, some of the quotes here, uh, absolutely it's a board level topic for sure, especially if it's B2C. Um, I don't think it's required for many organizations. If I'm honest, I, I, I probably agree currently. I think that at sea level um, discussion room, if you like, it, it honestly, it should probably have as fewer people as possible representing as many different stakeholders as possible. So primarily CIO slash CISO is probably the best suited to represent those identity interests, especially if they have the correct metrics, uh, observability, visibility, of how identity is operating within the organization, and be that authentication, authorization, access control, privacy, et cetera. So I, I do think the role of identity is improving hugely. Do we need a chief identity officer? I think, I think time will tell on that one. Q 
question number three. How do we kill the password? How do we kill the password? We have the technology. We have the standards. We have all of the, 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 the wonderful ways of measuring the benefits of things like passkeys, WebAuthn, FIDO2, etc. Yet we're all using bloody passwords every single day. I've used about three websites here that have just used usernames and passwords, not even MFA, which still astounds me. So a couple of different aspects to this. I'm primarily looking at passwordless in general. Um, where will that have the biggest benefit? Relatively balanced here. The, the B2C space heads primarily probably looking at that frictionless aspect, looking at being able to authenticate a very broad array of users from the cloud native, digital native, 18 year old, right through to the 80 plus uh, year old who's trying to access their pension or trying to do payments online or whatever it could be. So there's a huge benefit to being able to have a standardized, uh, both secure and usable approach to authentication in, in that respect. There's also that abandoned shopping cart driver as well. Um, clearly, if you are delivering maybe e-commerce or product delivery online, if you can reduce your abandoned shopping cart by only half a percent or one percent, that has a material baseline impact on your revenue generation. So being able to target that and deliver passwordless would clearly be a, a good idea. The second half, though, what is stopping you from doing this? And we did um, a passwordless buyer's guide um, about two years ago, I guess. Um, one of the biggest issues with adoption at the time was lack of coverage, lack of integration. Um, and this is really focused on delivering passwordless, and it could be FIDO2, passkeys, WebAuthn, um, being able to deliver that against as many different systems as possible. Most medium to large enterprises, so those in the 10,000 employees upwards, typically have five or more different MFA components, five. They don't want another one. They don't want five plus pass keys. They want pass keys only. So being able to deliver something like pass keys or FIDO2 or WebAuthn to more than one system, i.e. as many systems as possible, is going to be a huge operational and security benefit. So that lack of coverage, be that application integration, the ability to integrate with uh, identity providers and single sign-on providers, that's a huge one. The more coverage, the more systems you can cover, the more systems you can uh, integrate into that passwordless adoption process, the better. Um, a subset of those answers, we then double clicked and tried to look into how do you select an authentication solution. Now, we, we do a number of different workshops where we, we steal a few ideas from various different frameworks. We look at the sort of NIST cyber security framework and, and focus on that identify aspect. You know, I try to identify different authentication components with inside the enterprise. So um, which user communities, what authentication uh, model are they using? And looking at the security and usability aspects of that. So which AAL is being used from NIST, um, labeling and using um, various different uh, efficiency and effectiveness metrics for deciding is it usable? Um, and then going through a process of, okay, how do we migrate? How do we improve security? How do we consolidate? How do we uh, essentially reduce um, the number of uh, authentication components we have there? So 46% came out and said, we need to improve security. Seems, seems pretty obvious. The subtlety of that, of course, you're focusing on the solution, not necessarily the problem. Most end users, do they care about security and privacy? They say they do. Their behaviors would indicate otherwise. So it's a quite a subtle, subtly different aspect there. Um, we then double clicked on the, the biometrics aspect. Realistically, there are only two major ones, I guess, in the um, sort of consumer space, at least biometrics and fingerprints. Um, face recognition or face ID seems to be leading the way a little bit there. From a usability perspective, it clearly introduces huge benefits. You lift up the phone, you log yourself in. There are unexpected consequences of this, of course. You look at your phone to authenticate. You may just be looking at it to understand what you're looking at. Um, you know, you're looking at a transaction. Ah, oh, no, I didn't. I'm just looking at the transaction. I don't want the transaction to complete. So there are some subtle aspects there around uh, making usability 
too easy uh, and also introducing some barriers to execution. Um, especially in the, the B2C space, the end user actually wants to have some friction there. They want to have um, some, at least a noticeable barrier to something that's happening. The security theater argument, so Bruce Schneier's argument there around, as long as it looks secure, the end user feels happy. It doesn't need to be secure. Um, but I think if we, if we zoom out a little bit and maybe look at um, sort of biometrics for the next sort of three to five years, it would look likely that facial recognition or face ID stuff would be the default with the fingerprint perhaps as a second. Um, the interesting thing that surprised us was uh, behavior and movement came last here. Um, whereas actually behavior and, and uh, the movement aspect of how you hold a device and how you uh, interact with it physically is actually really powerful from a continuous authentication perspective. Clearly biometrics, very, very powerful for that atomic. Is it Simon? Yes, good. Five seconds later, 10 seconds later, you may need to re-authenticate again. If we're moving to this model of, of being more continuous, more continual, removing user interruption, but doing more transparent verification, movement and behavior ones could actually be the, the key to that. So that was, that was quite interestingly uh, at, at the bottom there. All righty, two more questions to go, I think. Um, number five. Machine identities, um, a hugely, hugely interesting area. Um, I was describing, um, we did a workshop on this a few weeks ago with a client, and they described this as um, a Titanic-style problem, a tip-of-the-iceberg-style problem. There are numerous different reports and statistics um, on the Tinter web around the number of uh, machine or service identities uh, as a multiple of person-based identities. And it ranges between maybe 38 to 50 times the number of machine identities versus uh, physical identities, people-based identities within any particular medium to large size enterprise. What does that mean? It means, to, I'm, I'm petrified of the machine ID problem because I don't think many organizations have full control over the machine identity lifecycle, the authentication and authorization use cases, visibility, monitoring, you name it. Clearly, definition of machines is quite varied, but we could be talking anything from an OAuth 2 API right the way through to a, a piece of operational technology. These machines are all going to be representing themselves to other machines, to other services, cloud services, etc. They need to be authenticated. So, 78% came back and said, absolutely, our machines need to have MFA. Now you just think for a second how difficult it is to get MFA working for people. You try and do that for machines. It is very complex. Most machines typically leverage certificate-based authentication, challenge response, TLS, mutual TLS-style interactions. That's a single factor, typically, possession-based factor of a piece of uh, crypto. Clearly, maybe a bit of nuance there between MFA and strong authentication, perhaps with maybe contextual or risk-based uh, checks in there as well. I think it's a very, very difficult ticking time bomb uh, of, of use cases and of, of problems to work upon. Um, machine ID is definitely um, a huge, uh, huge concern, I guess, for the next two to three years. All righty. AI, um, I think AI has definitely replaced, it's certainly replaced zero trust uh, is, the, is, is the RSA conference buzzword. Um, AI is good, it's great. I don't think it's gonna eat the world. I think it may eat software at some point. Um, it has huge, huge benefits. Absolutely, the bad guys have AI. Uh, they will also have other technology and tooling aspects as well, but so do the good guys. The good guys can leverage machine learning, AI, uh, large language models, generative concepts as well. We asked the question, where will it have the biggest impact across the identity stack, across the identity landscape? Now, we, we have a winner there in fraud and bot, but realistically, they're quite, it's quite close, quite a close from thing there, really. You probably ask that question again today may well get some slightly different answers, I guess. But I think the biggest takeaway is identity and access management is 
driving towards being a big data problem. What does that mean? Well, identity is becoming so foundational to our B2E interactions, our B2C online personas, machine identities. Identity is foundational to everything. So it becomes more important. And suddenly we have identity tentacles integrating with cloud systems, legacy systems, on-prem systems, B2C, B2E, IoT. It's, it's becoming huge for everything that we do. By design, that means the inputs and outputs to that identity fabric become larger and larger and larger. We have more information. Authentication interactions, device interactions, our history, our preferences, our transactions, where we've been, what we've done, threat intelligence, risk intelligence. All of that stuff has to be mangled, stored, analyzed in some way, shape or form. And it looks by design that AI ML will have huge benefits at the entire identity lifecycle from onboarding and proofing, credential issuance, authentication, who we are, uh, who we say we are, the device we're using, etc. So it clearly looks like AI ML will have a, a huge, huge role to play. And I guess fraud, bot detection and bot reduction there, leading the way primarily because there's cost involved here. Fraud costs people money. People want to save money, they want to automate, they want to be as efficient as they possibly can. And I think for today, yeah, absolutely, fraud is, is a good target. I think the risk analysis aspect and the governance aspect, they are two huge problems which have been around for a long, long time. And I think, again, any problem which has not got a simple or easy solution will drive towards iteration, drive towards continual innovation and continual development. And it would, it would seem likely that um, AI and ML would have a huge role to play there. So what do you think now? Where, where do you think the next five years are heading? Um, nobody has a, a crystal ball, I guess. And we like to try and look at maybe solutions too much as opposed to the actual problems we face as an industry. But clearly, I think AI is here to stay. Clearly, applying AI to the control plane, maybe Face ID will be the, be the way forward. Hybrid cloud, I think, is here to stay. I don't think everything is going to be cloud uh, deployed. I think we're going to have that, um, I guess, feet in two camps. How do we secure machines? Um, I think pass keys perhaps maybe isn't the answer there, but I think how we secure machines in general, from APIs through to physical operational technology, is a huge problem. One thing we've, we've seen a little bit this morning already is, is the metrics and mon mon monitoring of, of identity. How do we measure the success of passkeys rollout, biometric adoption, access control management, improvements to governance and administration? How do we measure that stuff? Because people really only work against the things that they can measure. If you can't measure abandoned shopping carts, improvements to usability, improvements to security, the end user and the organization will not work towards that stuff. So we need to focus upon some of those IA metrics, which may well negate the need to have maybe chief identity officers going forward. So it's a bit anecdotal, it's a bit fun, trying to introduce some different concepts, different, different topics, I guess, across the broader identity landscape. I think the main takeaway is really, identity is so vitally important to everything we do. And yes, pass keys, I think I only mentioned it twice, Pasky is a huge part to play in that and improving the authentication journey. Um, and hopefully over the next maybe three, four, five years, we start to see some improvements across other parts of the identity stack as well. Um, I am going to be here for the next couple of days. I'd love to hear as many different stories as possible from your either authentication journeys or your identity in general. Um, enjoy the rest of the conference. Uh, and so any questions, we've probably got a minute or two to, to answer a few. Well, first of all, thank you, Simon, so much. For sharing the data with us. Thank you. Um, I love data, so I'm kind of a big nerd. I'm going to let you ask, and then, I'll, and then I'll ask the question from the app. How's that? Sorry if you mentioned it already, but some of the questions had answers with a green checkbox. What was the green checkbox? Oh, let's have a look. Let's go back. Oh, it just has, yeah, it has just a check. Um, oh, I don't know. Yeah, 
it's not wouldn't be my answer. Oh, it's your answer. It might have been, oh, gotcha. It might have been my marketing person who took the screenshots answer. <clears throat> let's not let's not blame any marketing people for the problems. Definitely. So that one has that one hasn't. I think it is the person who answered. It wasn't me though. Good spot. Good eagle eyes. Yeah. Good eagle eyes. Um, we had a couple questions in the app uh, as well. So the first question is with regard to the um, the one about barriers to adopting passwordless. Mm -hmm. um, of the the options, were those all the options chosen? I'm only asking because. When we asked that question, we actually um, have done a few similar uh, surveys, but the, yeah, I think you just passed it. The, um, the, one, the one they actually picked was not something you have here, which is like, we don't know how. Okay. <laughs> is that something that you're finding as you talk to these uh, organizations that they're just feeling a lack of education or that they're just not really sure, you know? I think, um not, not directly. I think, I think organizations, they know how to get started. I think the, the passwords versus passwordless is a huge journey. As mm -hmm. we, the previous um, talk there was talking about this security spectrum, I think it was talking about. Um, it's definitely a journey. I think organizations know passwords are bad. Passwordless is great. I think what they struggle with is, is where to start yeah. and how to move forward. Right. Yeah. So how to prioritize your applications. Which apps should I start first? Um, which MFAs should I consolidate next? Uh, which user community should I enroll mm -hmm. first as part of the starting uh, project or POC or whatever mm -hmm. it could be? That's where they struggle yeah. with. Because everybody's like, well, mm, wh wh where's the compelling event? Or my app's really important, we need to go first. Mm -hmm. So there's definitely a lack of design pattern or lack of yep. consistency yep. around, okay, I know it's bad. I know I need to get there. I'm not quite sure on the, the steps involved in, in doing that, which is quite specific to the organization. I think certainly understanding and looking at the business problem first, really what, what's the impact of not doing something, of not including a particular application or not including a particular uh, user group. I think those sorts of things are quite specific, um, but they can be worked through, through it's workshops. Like, um, I think so similar what we find, it's almost like paralysis by analysis almost, so I'll just, I don't Correct. know, so I just will do nothing. Um, so I think it, it's that's really it's helpful in, in terms of like what is needed for like playbooks and, and just like more guidance it's around. It's leading with things. the business problems as well, not not the solution. Tech is, if we're honest, it's the easy bit. It, it's mm -hmm. understanding why the business is trying to do this stuff mm -hmm. and that's the bit which people struggle with. Yeah, and so um, we're heading into a break, but you just gave me what I needed, which is when we get back at 3.30, we actually have a very uh, wonderful uh, topic, which is becoming a champion within your own organization, like doing that sort of internal sales process, um, which I, I, on my soapbox, is like one of my like biggest things that doesn't get talked enough about, which is you got you to make sure everybody's on the same page within the organization yeah. before you can do anything. Um, so thank you so much for this. And we're just going to head into a break. So you have a wonderful half an hour over at Luna Law. And then we'll see you back here around 3.30. Stuff. Thank you.